So welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Commercial Real Estate 101 Meetup Group. Uh, it's great to see you all uh, this Thursday afternoon. Uh, for those of you guys who are tuning in for the first time, we've been doing this meetup for the last uh, couple of years. Uh, we, we really focus on trying to invite speakers on a variety of different topics pertaining to commercial real estate. Uh, and today, we have the honor of having Mike Downey, uh, who is going to be talking about agricultural real estate because... And this is this is one that I've actually been looking forward to because you know we're located in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, we're a decent sized metro uh, here in Kentucky, but there's a lot of farmland surrounding the city that is starting to be redeveloped into, you know, either industrial or, or all, all different types, retail, you know, you name it. So it's really cool, and and hopefully we can we can garner some insights from you regarding you know that the development side, but also you know on the farms the farming side as well. So I'm sure you were also work with farmers to be able to acquire some of these properties for their businesses as well. So uh, really excited to host you, man. Yeah, great to be here. Appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely, no, no. I mean, I because usually when we we when I do research on different topics, I, I try to just look through my network to see, you know. Get garner inspiration, and and I saw that you specialize in agricultural real estate. And I was like, man, that, that that could be a really cool topic to discuss. So, before we get diving into the 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 the, the specifics, I really wanted to, I guess, touch on your background. So, if you could kind of tell us a little bit about yourself, that'd be awesome. You bet. Yeah, I'm located physically here in the state of Iowa, right in the heart of the Midwest. Born and raised on a family farm. I did not have the opportunity myself to go back to my family farm, which led me to just entering the you know, the, the workforce as an ag professional started out working with a farm management, farm real estate brokerage company for a number of years. And then along the way, took an interest in uh, working with family farms and producer uh, operations on their transition planning, estate planning, uh, which is what I do today. And then, uh, but then along the way, my wife and I have also been, you know, personally investing passively into real estate, our big dream or legacy we wish to leave our children is farmland, but uh, I'm sure we'll talk about it today. One of the disadvantages of farmland is it doesn't cash flow very well. So at our position in our lives of the young family, we decided to start investing actually in commercial real estate that does offer better cash flow as everybody in this group obviously already knows. And so we're, we're basically have been leveraging the benefits of commercial real estate to better position ourselves hopefully over time to, to purchase farmland. And uh, we have purchased a farm just a couple of years ago and work back and forth with my wife's, wife's family farm now here in Eastern Iowa. But, uh, but yeah, that's the long-term legacy, if you will. And uh, that, you know, I see the two kind of fit hand in hand. For sure. No, I appreciate the context there. So it'll at least give us an understanding of, you know, your expertise in the space, because it is a very niche type of, of, of area that you've chosen to focus in. And understandably, because of your experience, obviously, on your family farm and, and operating within the space for as long as you have, I mean, it definitely provides you with unique insights. So, you know, one thing I'm kind of curious about is, you know, on from from the brokerage standpoint, do you typically work with, oh, you'd mentioned estate planning, and everything else, do you typically work with landowners? that are deciding what they want to do with their family farm at the point of retirement or whatever else? Or do you also work with, you know, farm operators that want to lease la uh, farmland for, you know, their, their business operations? Yeah. You know, technically I'm part of two entities. Um, farm financial strategies is historically work with family farms that do have an heir to pass the farm to. So we work with them on the, the old uh, fair versus equal conversation of, you know, if we have some kids that are part of the farm, others that are off the farm, and how do we balance that and manage the estate tax and tra minimize transfer costs as uh, the assets do pass from one generation to the next. Um, the newer entity and picture in my background is NextGen. Uh, NextGen Ag Advocates was founded by two farmers here in Iowa, which I joined and uh, founded in 2018. But it's more about there's a fair amount of transition that occurs, as you can probably appreciate, between non-related parties. And uh, that's where we get involved with helping link up young and aspiring farmers to maybe a retiring farmer that doesn't have a successor or children that farm. Um, also, that's where we get involved, to your point, on more of helping with some private real estate transactions and helping people on the rental side, setting up fair 
leasing relationships as farms transition? Because the big kind of big picture concern I have as an industry is there's a disconnect occurring from one generation to the next. We need to really do a much better job of educating those that are inheriting farmland, those who are purchasing farmland. You know, we have professional athletes now that have pulled together that want to buy farmland. You know, where are they going to get their information on how to to manage their farmland investment? Absolutely. And, and, and hopefully, you know, obviously with what you're doing and you, we, we talked offline a little bit about you, you know, wanted, starting a meetup and everything else. So I'm hopeful that, you know, your education to the masses is something that's going to benefit people who are looking to potentially invest uh, in these types of properties. So, you know, w- what I'd like to do is maybe break down, you know, different uh, avatars uh, that you've typically worked with just to provide some context for those people on the call. So let's say that you're starting to work with, you know, aspiring uh farmer, uh, maybe they've been on a family farm on their own, and now they want to branch off and do their own thing. Or maybe, you know, they've had some experience working on other people's farms, but now they want to kind of t- branch off and do their own thing. I guess, from a tenant's perspective, what type of, you know, structure are you typically seeking for for your cl- tenant clients? And along with that, you know, what are some of the expectations that need to be set with that process? Sure, you bet. You know, back in the good old days, I'll just set up set the stage here uh, a lot of farmland landlord and tenants operate on a 50 50 crop share it was a simple we split the income split the expenses and at the end of the year you you divide the profits up 50 50 um but as land values have continually to increase gradually over time and the, just the cost structure and farm economics and demographics of landowners just uh we have a record high demographic that owns farmland um here in the state of iowa about a third is owned by those 75 years or older and uh as more and more of that transitions to the next generation that's more removed um they don't have as much comfort level to be part of the the growing of the crops you know sharing risk and rewards and so that's where the industry has really trended strongly toward just a simple cash rent, you know, you know, not, not a lot different than if you uh, have a multifamily property and they're paying rent, you know, so it's a much more simple um, setup as far as setting up the lease arrangement. Um, the real challenge I have, actually, I'm writing an article right now for Farm Futures that I write for on just what I call this lag effect that occurs that Unfortunately, a lot of rents are established before we know what the outcome of the upcoming crop is going to be. So we have these a lot of ups and downs with volatility. So, and that creates some challenges. And we're seeing that right now because with inflation and everything, the costs of production have gone up. Uh, grain prices have come down. Um, but a lot of the rents right now for this year were established based on what happened last year. So uh, that's the big, big part of it where we try to come in and provide some education, good information to those that own the land as they set up a fair rental rate for their tenant. And is that rental rate, like you said, is it is it is it modified yearly or is it one of those things where it's similar to commercial real estate where you do agree to a base rent and then there's maybe, mod- you know, minor increases throughout the year or is it any different than that typically? Oh, yeah, you just set it up perfectly the the volley on this because uh you know i'm looking right now at the the article i'm writing so iowa state university does an annual cash rent survey a lot of the universities do Illinois, you know university of illinois and some of the others but you know the the recent press here last year is they just came out with their press release at you know the highest on record per the survey um you know which is probably you know a lot of people will run across this and might think well my rent needs to go higher but you know, a lot of this survey data was based on information from last year. So, you know, what's happening now as we look ahead, but that's why us as an entity next gen, we've actually favored a different type of lease arrangement versus a simple fixed year to year. It's more, it's called a flex lease, maybe a variable cash rent lease that has a base price, but flexibility to go up and down based on what actually happens that year for the crop based on commodity prices and yields. Yeah. So it takes yeah. a lot of the pressure off of having to figure out year to year what is fair, not knowing what's going to come up 
come ahead. That's amazing. Yeah, in the retail space, we 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 have sometimes have percentage leases where a, if you hit a certain strike price for your vol- sales volume, you you get a a certain amount that you have to pay back to the landlord in additional rent. So, you know, it seems like that could potentially be something similar. I'm not sure if there's you know, any type of modifications that Yeah, no, it's to us it's like the modern day alternative to prop share 50 50 30 40 years ago because there's still a a profit sharing component of sharing of risk and reward but still a baseline income that's guaranteed for the landowner so it's to us it just cultivates better relationships longer term that makes sense well that's awesome and so you know one thing i'm also curious about is obviously on the tenant side you know you you've kind of established that some of the things you need to look out for when it comes to you know leasing you know, is the, the rate, obviously that's important because you have variability when it comes to cash flows, depending on what the yield is for the crop, you know, input prices and everything else. So that's something to consider on the acquisition side of farmland. And, and, you know, I'm not, not too familiar with, you know, the different nuances of, you know, what you can grow on, on site, depending on different zoning or, you know, whatever you're trying to accomplish, I guess, could you provide some context as to, let's say I'm a, you know, relatively established, you know, farm uh, entity, and I want to acquire land to operate whatever vertical, uh, operate whatever vertical within there, the, 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 of my business, whether that's, you know, growing weed or, you know, I, I'm not sure how it works for livestock or anything like that. If you could provide some context, I think that'd be great. As far as on the acquisition side, on the acquisition side, yeah, if you could, and and I'm sure it's some there's some parallels probably to the tenant side as well because you 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 may need to understand like how this works so that you're not signing up for a lease that you know you you can't execute your business plan on. Yeah, yeah, I mean it's you know a lot of it comes down to to dollars and return on investments. Um, you know, return on investment in a farmland. Uh, you know, those that are purchasing it are doing it, knowing it's a long-term investment that appreciates gradually over time. You know, a typical return on investment for farmland for based on the land rents is maybe two to 3%. Mm-hmm. So, you know, now that even, you know, bank CD rates have climbed to four to 5%, you know, it'll be interesting to see if that affects the interest level in farmland, which there's been much, much more interest in recent years from those outside of agriculture to come into ag and buy land. And, you know, I personally feel there's maybe some more higher level reasons and conversations going on that that return on investment isn't necessarily driving it. It's more of, you know, buying a long-term asset that's uh, tangible that they're not making anymore. It's diversification. And even this bigger picture of food production and supply for the, you know, for the world in the future and having a stake in that because they're, you know, the old saying, they're not making any more land. So we're actually losing it every day due to urban sprawl and development across the country. So definitely. So so on the, on the, on the, on the farming side though, I'm just kind of curious, you know, is, is it more, and maybe this is more based on municipality with, with our zoning laws, for example, we have an agricultural designation where you can kind of operate your, your enterprise as you would normally, as far as the nuances of it, I'm not too familiar with it on our, our local level. I'm not sure if on your guys' side, there's designations for if you wanted to grow specific particular crops or, you know, if there's any licensing you need, if you're going to have certain types of livestock or anything like that, I'm not, not, not sure if that's the case. Yeah, there is zoning, you know, classifications out here, you know, agricultural versus commercial versus industrial versus residential. Um, I'm not aware of any significant um, restrictions on what folks can grow. I mean, farmers are must follow certain like conservation programs, especially if they're operating on highly erodible lands deemed by the USDA. Um, So that might require them to follow certain conservation practices to preserve the land and reduce erosion and so forth. Um, But yeah, a lot of times the crops, it's just driven by a supply demand market. You know, what's, you know, what's the market need and what's the area actually support for growing crops. You know, obviously I'm in a world here where there's a lot of corn and soybeans, a lot of livestock too. You just don't see it because a lot of it now is in livestock barns. 
Um, whereas down in your area, there might be more wheat and other crops, you know, just based on the climate and the geography. Definitely. No, that, that's some great advice. So, so on, on the, the landlord side, so you obviously, like you said, you, a third of, which is mind boggling to me that one third of the, the land that is currently owned by individuals in your area, uh, there it's owned by people who are in there's, I think you said 75 years of age. So that there's a big transition occurring when it comes to them either bequeathing it to their heirs or, you know, whoever else they just deem it appropriate to either sell it or whatever else. No, now on the leasing side. So let's say that I'm a person who owns farmland. So let's say maybe you, you go out there and you buy, you know, 150 to 100 acres of farmland. And now you want to make it attractive for, you know, more of a industrial tenant or I wouldn't say industrial tenant, but more, more so for a an individual who is wa wanting to operate on the farmland, I guess, what are some of the things that you can do to make it attractive for that type of use? So if you're advising a client saying, look, let's try to see if we can do this so that we can make it attractive and, and market it to the right user. Sure. So generally speaking, there's a, a strong level of competition for access to land by farm operations, younger producers. So quite frankly, uh, we probably operate in a market where the landowner holds the the cards because we are in a very highly competitive rental market, you know, and you're starting to see more platforms out there where they, you know, can simply just go list their farm out virtually for rent, you know, kind of the Craigslist, Craigslist type concept, you know, or Facebook marketplace. And those can go good or bad, you know, you know, they, those don't always complement the, the farm longer term. But, uh, but yes, yeah, as, as far as that goes, um, that's really the challenge we see is, you know, if a landowner that's more removed is uh, they may not have the local connections in that neighborhood to know to who even to go to. And there's certainly farm management companies out there and entities that can help them and guide them with that. Um, but that is the kind of one of the bigger elements ahead that concerns us as more and more land transitions is. How will the farmland be managed? Where will they go get their information? You know, if somebody Googles and finds a, a platform virtually to list your farm um, for rent, they may not know that there's other alternatives. They may just real, think that's the way to do it because that's what they, they found out there on the World Wide Web, if you will. Um, but, you know, again, longer term, it's not always about the income and getting the highest rent either for landowners. You know, the conservation piece you know, what's important for that farm at, you know, finding the, the right tenant to match those goals is what's what we feel is the most important. For sure. Cause I mean, I'm assuming these leases are pretty long term. They're not, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong. How, how long are these leases typically in place for? Well, that kind of goes back to what I talked about earlier in this um, piece I'm writing right now is a, a lot of them, quite frankly, are year to year. And that just wow. supports the, this issue of, this lag effect in rents and from one year to the next, that's where the variable cash rent lease, where we have a flexible component built in, we, we have found builds in more of a longer term partnership feel that, okay, hey, we're working together. Um, we may not sign a 20 year lease, but it takes a lot of that pressure off the year to year uncertainty because we have this process in place where everybody kind of knows how the rents can be established regardless of what prices and yields do. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and it's, it's kind of a, like you said, a partnership. So if the, if the, if the operator does well, then ultimately the, the landlord I'm assuming will, will benefit as well because they'll be able to share in the profits of that yield. But, you know, again, you're not mm. hamstringing the, the operator. If for some reason the, the, the yield for that year or our operating costs just went through the roof and the, the profits just not there. So um, right. Yeah, definitely. When there's that profit sharing component, we're kind of in it together. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it makes the message more about the farm and it even directly or indirectly incentivizes the landowner to maybe make improvements to the farm because if they improve fertility or, you know, drainage, uh, some conservation practices, whatever it may be, that if that increases yield over time, that indirectly maybe increases uh, potential bonus payments they may get as yields increase. Absolutely. That's some great advice. So 
I'm sure you've you've noticed this. I know I've noticed it in our market. Uh, you know, there's a lot of land that used to be agriculturally zoned that is now being rezoned to more commercial uses. And you start seeing uh, roadways being expanded. You know, there's a we have a big industrial backbone here. So even south of us, you know, historically it's been a lot of agriculturally zoned land. A highway comes through, and now you start seeing these massive industrial parks that are being developed and rezoning is taking place. And a lot of these legacy farmers have sold their land to these developers to now develop these types of projects. Now, you know, obviously I'm not sure if that's something that, that you advise on a lot of times with, with some of these, you know, entities that are looking to transition, like as part of the transition plan. But, you know, as far as that's concerned, have you seen that trend also in your area? And if so, I guess, what type of advice do you typically give, you know, owners of these pro properties that may be good candidates for redevelopment? Yeah, crazy uh, statistic I'll share um, somewhere I, I read where for every every 60 seconds, we lose one acre of productive farmland to urban sprawl and development across the wow. country. And uh, it's crazy to put your arms around that, you know, an, an acre of farmland is 43,560 square feet, if you want to try to visualize that. But, you know, that's in a lot of those areas, the the land trades on a price per square feet, you know, for development versus out here in rural America, land trades based on a price per acre. So, uh, um, but yeah, that's you know a reality that we're probably not going to going to stop as as far as the uh, trends occurring with urban sprawl and development. But that's why you've seen in the industry um, a lot more of motives and incentives and a push, if you will for the lands that we do have to really do the best we can to manage them, be good stewards of the land from a conservation standpoint. And uh, to that point, you know, we feel that those in the future that will own land that are maybe more removed or not from a family farm, that's okay. But just understand that, hey, there's some responsibilities and accountability you might have to follow to manage this because this is something that you're going to pass down to the next generation that's going to you know, be used to continue to provide food across the country and we're not making any more of it. So. Absolutely. So I guess, have you had a lot of conversations? I mean, that, I'm sure because in my mind, and, and again, you can, you can kind of provide context to this. Most, I would imagine of the, the individuals who have operated in a family uh, farm environment for, for decades, let's say you're 75, 80 years old, you've, you've been a farmer your entire life. They have a vested interest in seeing their farm succeed. Now, as far as their heirs are concerned, maybe some have a vested interest while others may just not even be in, in interested in maintaining the farm or getting into the family business. And so I'm sure you have discussions with the heirs to kind of have, you know, see what that happens. Because even locally here, for example, I know we've, we've operated in the space for a little while here in Louisville and, and you know, we've had discussions with with heirs of, of farmland to determine what the best course of action is. Sometimes that means, you know, maintaining it as agricultural land and, you know, selling it off to, you know, potential, you know, someone who could actually operate the land. But then if it's in the path of progress and you've already had roads come through it, as far as the de the development capabilities, it's, it's probably a lot more uh, attractive to potential developers. So I'm not sure if you've had those types of discussions. And, and I'm sure it doesn't apply in every scenario because there's the highest and best use for a lot of land is maybe agricultural. So I'm just kind of curious if you've had those types of discussions. Yeah, I don't definitely. I've, I've actually been directly involved with some, some operations that were directly in the path of progress. Uh, I've even been involved with some that their land has just been basically taken by eminent domain, whether they wanted wow. to sell it or not. So they're almost forced to, uh, to sell just because of where they're located. And, uh, but, you know, I, I think you're familiar with 1031 exchanges, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've worked with a lot of operations to help them go locate if they're going to be forced to sell and move for whatever reason, um, to try to relocate other land that will still benefit their farm operation. And sometimes if we're not able to do that, maybe we can go out there and find one that maybe it'll hopefully benefit another operation or young producer, but we can put in these arrangements that if there's ever an opportunity to sell that it, it gives a first right refusal back to the, to the one that is renting it to them. So just trying to create a lot of win-wins with and make the best out of what we have to work with. That's awesome. Uh, that's, that's some great uh, context that you provided. So another question I have is obviously, 
farm the, the, a farming business i mean it's an enterprise i mean it's amazing to me the amount of money that goes into operating a farm it's it's unbelievable so as far as the the you know being able to value the farming business I, i'm sure i'm sure as part of the transition plan do you guys also operate in the the space where let's say they want to sell their enterprise to a larger farming entity do you guys also help with that that process as well yeah next gen we have kind of this matching program where we're we're seeing more and more operate you know the general trend with farm operations is they're growing there's fewer of them and they're growing consolidating grow, growing larger in size and willing to travel farther with our more modern day equipment they're able to cover a lot more acres a lot more efficiently and the technology in the cabs of the equipment is amazing you know i'd be a topic of a whole nother meetup uh just crazy watching that uh what's occurring in the ag industry as far as technology and advan advancements but uh yeah yeah there's a lot more operations just teaming up because of the capital required you know my grandpa came back from world war ii to start my family farm operation from basically scratch you know that's virtually impossible today with the capital required to to buy a full line of farm equipment that's required to raise crops plus the access to the land and land costs so that's why we're seeing more and more kind of team up to maybe use the same line of equipment even for multiple operations and kind of working better and i'm seeing a lot of that in the next generation too that are they're much more willing to collaborate work together we're seeing peer groups occur in the ag industry just collaborating and thinking out, outside the box to you know and then the other part of it is this passive income and investing in commercial real estate is there's a lot of operations unfortunately need to rely on some off-farm income to help support a farm operation and that's uh where we've kind of tied in our farm raised community where there's folks interested in looking at, you know, investment opportunities to create some passive income. Makes sense. No, for sure. And, and do you, do you see, I guess, you know, a marketplace for selling your farming business that you've had for, you know, 20, 30 years. And I guess as far as the valuation process is concerned, is there a way to kind of know whether or not what, what, what the value for that sort of thing is? Yeah, I'm not sure it's as easy as like just putting up your business for sale. And, sure, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, but yeah. certainly there, there's definitely a demand for it. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to valuing the assets, you know, the line of equipment. And then, uh, you know, just kind of working through strategies to best do that from a tax standpoint, you know, because uh, one of the big um, challenges for a retiring farmer is finding an exit strategy because they've been spending their farming career deferring income, buying equipment for the depreciation write-offs. And they're on this treadmill, if you will. And sometimes it's hard to jump off that. So if we can match them up with a younger producer that's willing to kind of jump on the treadmill as they jump off, even if it's over a four to five year period, that typically uh, results in a win-win, a better exit strategy for the uh, aging farmer, retiring farmer looking to exit and a better entrance strategy for those coming in to buy into a line of equipment or take on X amount more acres over a period of years versus trying to figure out how to do that all at one time. Absolutely. So it's more of like a seller finance deal where, you know, you spread the the total cost of the acquisition over a five year or however long period. Yeah, that'd be a fair way to say it. You know, a lot, you know, it, a lot of retiring farmers, a lot of their equity that they're going to rely on for their retirement years is in that equipment. Uh, obviously, a lot of them have hopefully bought some farms over their farming career, too, that they can then turn around and cash rent to somebody else for uh, passive rental income. But, you know, coming up with some creative financing or even leasing type strategies for the equipment, that equity in the equipment is subject to recapture tax. And that's, you know, kind of similar to selling commercial properties subject to recapture. And we have to manage that tax burden. Awesome. All right. Well, um, one last question, and then we're going to go ahead and open up the Q&A because I'm sure there's plenty of people on the call and on LinkedIn that, that may have uh, some questions to ask. So 
as far as you know you kind of alluded to you know you you do write for uh is it is it a uh, a magazine uh that that references a lot of this information but as far as resources are concerned what what are some of the best ways and resources out there to learn more about you know this particular vertical uh, farmland yeah there's a number of different uh, ag pub publications the one that i write a monthly blog for is farm futures uh, i think that you can find that out there on uh, my blog is actually called more than dirt so i just write about anything to do with farmland or farm transition you know just anything to do generally it might be top of mind um that's just a third-party informational source um Certainly, I, I throw out our website, nextgenag.us, yeah. that we're actually in the process of revamping. We're also about ready to announce officially we're going to do a monthly meetup now through our next gen, which will be sponsored through next gen, just on what we a lot about what we talked about today, but just do it on a monthly basis to open it up to anybody that wants to come in. And we might have a certain topic one month. We may not. We it may just be a general open conversation. Um, otherwise the, you know, the ag universities all do an excellent job of providing good information, Iowa state university, university of Illinois, Purdue, Missouri, and, and so on. Um, so yeah, you know, with the internet and everything, it's not too difficult to go find information if you're, you know, on whatever area you're looking for. Absolutely. No, for sure. And, you know, at, at regarding the, the meetup, uh, you know, consider recording these things too, because, you know, I've been doing, we've been doing it for a while now and we've gotten a pretty broad reach uh, for, from people that are just tuning in to watch and even converting it into a podcast format is, is something we do. And it's, we've had a lot of success with that. So. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I definitely would like to follow up with you on that. Cause yeah, uh, yeah. it's, it's been a little bit of a loan, learning curve, you know, as, as we have been kind of laying it out and getting it all set up. Absolutely. No, I'm happy to, connect over you know the zoom call or something later on uh to kind of help you guys out with that that's awesome so what we'll go ahead and do then is we'll open up to q a so if you guys haven't already uh go ahead and type away in the chat box uh i'll be checking on linkedin as well to make to see if anyone has had uh any comments or questions that they may have let's see I guess one thing that I'm curious about, uh, do, do you, is there a particular question that you wish that I would have asked you that, you know, you think would be something that would be relevant to the audience? You know, one question that I get asked a lot is, you know, as people understand what I'm doing, you know, I'm passionate about helping family farms transition. So you say an estate planning planner and, but I'm also involved in commercial real estate. Um, and created this new community of others in the ag community. So I didn't know how this would go over, but, you know, the topic of farmland versus other real estate classes is something that I'm asked a lot because there's a, a lot of folks out there that are teaming up outside of agriculture to buy land, you know, uh, whereas we're putting a format together to actually do the opposite, allow people in the ag community to team together to look at, alternative investments to diversify outside of agriculture. So uh, that's a question that I get asked a lot, but, you know, from my own research, just with commercial real estate, you know, multifamily, whatever the asset class may be, just over time, um, it's been very recession proof, as you know, mm -hmm. you know, everybody needs a place to stay, um, that there's a housing shortage across the country. Um, <laughs> There's a reason why 90% of millionaires millionaires own real estate, and uh, and that's what we wish to do long term is to to buy farmland. But farmland for us is what maybe other people consider as gold. You know, a place to preserve your wealth. It's gonna be a nice steady asset to do that. It's just problem with it just doesn't cash flow real well. So um, we're just using one asset group to leverage ourselves to help buy. Um, another over time so absolutely and 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 like you said there's different verticals within commercial real estate that that obviously offer different benefits and drawbacks so you know being able to educate your clients on what that looks like is obviously a benefit so on and, andrea so hey andrea how's it going she had three questions so we'll start off with the first one just for those of you guys who are listening in a podcast format uh what are some of the qualified resources to find land for sale 
qualified resources to find farmland for sale. You know, the, yeah, qualified, it was is key there um, because you can find all kinds of resources out there. There's uh, online formats now that you can list your farms for sale. Um, you know, do a Google search out there. You can find all the land brokerage uh, companies that specialize specifically in farmland. Um, as far as qualified, you know, that would be, you know, kind of buyer beware, if you will, like the, the saying in commercial real estate, I would probably say, say, this, say the same thing in farmland space as well is just to uh, make sure you do your own due diligence that, uh, you know, the, the seller you're working with is qualified or whoever the agent is that's helping them is qualified. But, you know, we live in a world where you can do a lot of good, good due diligence due diligence and find good information on your own to verify all of that. A lot of it's out there available publicly for that matter, as far as, uh, you know, property taxes and uh, soil suitability ratings of particular farm tracks. Absolutely. And topography, I'm sure makes a difference with some of these larger tracks. So that's, that's great. So next, next, next question, uh, Andre had was how do I track road slash highway changes? So I'm assuming expansions or expansion, uh, I guess where they're going to put a road or highway or maybe expand a road or a highway. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's a question. I don't know that I've thought through before. I mean, cause that kind of hits home because we just saw an expansion bypass just come around our um, local community that impacted some local landowners. And it was kind of a source of some debate, as you might imagine, but that's probably really going to come down to the, you know, the government infrastructure, you know, what long-term planning they may have. So I would probably try to get in touch with somebody with the, the highway, highway road department or whatever entity that, is doing long-term planning, you know, for infrastructure to see what those five, 10, 20 year plans may look like. That's a great, great, great point. Yeah. I, I called the department of transportation. Uh, so in, in our market, we have this overlay that's called logic and it tells you what roads are city versus state roads. So depending on whether they're city or state, you can contact the, the, the respective, uh, the, uh, department of transportation to get gather some additional insights. I do it a lot because I do. In, I'm in the retail side, so I want to know if there's traffic lights that are going in in certain certain locations. So they'll do traffic studies to determine whether or not it's feasible. But I'm sure at the state level, especially if you're talking about these highways, they're probably going to be able to provide you context as far as you know what what their future plans are for you know different roads and such. So that's awesome. So next question is: Do do you more? Do you more so see the enterprise farming companies purchasing land for expansion or private individuals purchasing land? You know, that's a source of debate out there is, you know, who, you know, who's going to own and operate farmland in the future? How's that going to impact, impact the integrity of the family farm? Um, who should own farmland? You know, there's, I just, my last piece for farm futures, actually, there, there's just kind of a, it's a topic out there that I'm hearing a lot in the countryside is, you know, sh should we impose some type of a tax to those that are non-resident landowners? Uh, or should there be some type of an incentive? Uh, how do we incentivize those that here that live locally in, in our own counties to, to own the land where that money and income they generate from the farm will be used to support the local county and community? Um, so it's certainly a debate. I don't know if I have a strong, you know, I, uh, I do feel like there's a responsibility to educate those outside entities to the, to the question here on the responsibilities when you do buy a farmland investment. But uh, yeah, there's definitely a fair amount of them coming in. Uh, there's a lot of interest and uh, yeah, just uh, I think it's not going to probably go away. And quite frankly, I think a key attribute of a future farmer is the relationships they hold with their landlords, the future buyers of farmland, and those that are going to inherit the farmland in the next generation. Yeah, that's a great point. So Aaron, so hey, Aaron, uh, they say, I have seen lenders raising the down payment for land. They're requesting 40 to 50%. Why is that? 
a lot of that is to, to do with land land values, land prices, record high. You know, we've had farms, you know, one farm here in Northwest Iowa that brought 30,000 an acre. That's just pure farmland, um, you know, but pretty common for very highly productive farmland to bring, just farmland, no development potential at all to bring, you know, 15,000 an acre to 20,000. So, um, so, but I, I think what you're, a lot of these lending and down payment requirements, um, there's still a lot of lenders out there in the industry that lived through the financial crisis, the farm crisis of the 1980s. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of farmers lost their farms during that time when interest rates went sky high, basically into the teens. So that is, uh, you know, still uh, resonates with a lot of folks out there now with what's happened with interest rates. So I think a lot of lenders have just pulled the reins back. So as land values have gone up, um, so has a lot of the equity on the balance sheets of farmers. So if you use the same LTV loan to value requirements of five years ago, just because of what's happened with land prices, you know, they could technically on paper lend out a lot more, but with what's going on with interest rates and everything, I think they're pulling things back. Yeah, and 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 also figuring debt service because, like you said, I mean, from a from a productivity standpoint, if you're just looking at the financials of leasing farmland, you may not be able to get as much as you can for a, a, a piece of dirt that has been developed, and you have you know a building on it that you can then lease out. So that may be another factor is that you know can can if you were to buy the land and not have it produce anything, can you service the debt without the business itself? Like if you were just going to lease out the land to an operator, um, is it going to be able to service? So um, I would imagine that could potentially be a variable as well. So yeah, and that's another dilemma. We work in family farm transitions with helping set up estate plans where there might be buyouts between family. But to to buy a farm and have the income from the cash rent alone service the debt, you're probably going to need well over fifty percent of the purchase in the form of a cash down payment if you want the income to you know help kind of make it self sufficient without having to subsidize it off from other income sources. Sure. So one thing I'm curious about, and this kind of just stemmed from the the lending question is how heavily involved is the SBA in the, the operation, like the, the, the funding of these types of projects? You know, the other thing we haven't talked about today is, you know, there's a, a lot of creative new enterprises that operations and the next generation are looking at, uh, you know, small produce, uh, farm to market, if you will, farm to table type enterprises, um, regenerative farming, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, direct to table. I think that's a trend we're going to continue to see increase. Uh, consumers want to know where their food's coming from. And, uh, so I, I'm not heavily involved as that part of it, but it's my understanding that some of those have worked with SBA loans to help set up those smaller businesses. Um, you know, as well as family farm operations that might qualify to be able to use those as well. Yeah. And then I know with the SBA that they're, they're kind of capped, I think at like 5 million total loan amounts. So I'm assuming for these larger operations, it's probably just not in the wheelhouse, but, you know, I was just curious to, to, to know, because it would make sense that, you know, it would be, it would behoove us as a, as an, as a government sponsored agency to, or not necessarily the government sponsored agency, but, but the purpose of the SBA is to help promote small business. And one of the most integral small businesses in the, in the United States, in my opinion, is, is obviously farming. I mean, we, we, pr- production of food is integral to the long-term success of us as a, as a nation. So, you know, you would figure that they would promote that quite yeah, significantly. And, and just this year in the Super Bowl, there was a commercial to address you know, there were some surveys done over in Illinois that they were surprised that the general consumer has this perception that farming is corporate, you know, big, big farming. And, you know, a lot of the land is being um, gobbled up by the large corporations, but really uh, a high majority going back to the prior question. I mean, I think here in Iowa, uh, still two thirds or more of the land that is offered for sale is still purchased by farmers. So that'd, and, that'd be that'd be individuals or family or some okay that's correct that's and then the Super Bowl commercial that was sponsored out of Illinois um, was the fact that ninety eight percent 
a family farms, a farms are still family owned, you know, so, you know, again, just that consumer education piece. So, um, family farms are getting larger, no doubt about it, but there's still, you know, a lot of fan, smaller family farm operations still out here. That's amazing. All right. Well, let's, let's look at uh, LinkedIn to see if you guys are watching on LinkedIn, feel free to type away. I'd love to get your questions answered along with that. If you guys are watching this on zoom, please type away. Uh, we'll give it out a minute more to answer any questions you guys may have. So Andra, she asks, Raphael, what was the software you mentioned for tracking road traffic light, et cetera, changes? So the, 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 it's specific to my market. It's called logic. I'd imagine you have something somewhat similar. It, it would, it, depending on which, if you're in a metro area, uh, you know, city overlay maps, essentially, is what the, what I would refer them to. You know, there's the property valuation administration in each local municipality that that kind of dictate that showcases you know property values and whatever else. And a lot of these municipalities and 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 uh, cities will have some form of overlay that they put on top of their map that showcase zoning and it showcases maybe you know assessed values. You know, I, I I'm not sure. I mean, obviously, it's very specific to my market. Logic is, but you know, in your market, it may be something different. Um, I know that, um, man, there, there's a big, I have to get back to you on that. There's, there's one very big, uh, software product out there that has kind of gobbled up a lot of these smaller municipality overlays. Uh, I'll have to get back to you on that though. I forgot the name of it. Okay. Well. Mike, it looks like you answered all the questions. So first off, I just wanted to thank you so much for your time. Uh, we really do appreciate the discussion. I, I think it's a fascinating discussion, and I think it's a very important discussion for us to understand because, like we had kind of alluded to earlier, I mean, you know, it's integral for us to be able to, you know, maintain and continue to produce at a high level uh, when it comes to food production. So I'm really uh, appreciative of the opportunity to kind of educate the broader commercial in real estate industry regarding this. So. If you don't mind, I, you know, if anyone wanted to learn more about what you're doing, you know, maybe there's there's operators out there that are wanting representation, or maybe even you know investors that are looking to you know kind of follow your your footsteps as far as wanting to acquire land for productive means. What 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 ways can they do to get in contact with you? I, I think the best way to to find me is, uh, you know, as far as the farmland side of it, nextgenag.us. And that website's going to be in revamped and updated. Uh, and that's where you'll build, find information on the monthly meetups that we're going to start doing there uh, through that company. Um, my newer uh, farm raised uh, for folks that are looking to diversify outside of agriculture or find ways to create some passive income. That's farmraisedcapital.com. And uh, I've also uh, forced myself to be more active out there on LinkedIn. And I think that's where we first found. So I am uh, out there active and that's where you'll find information on my blog that I write on anything to do with farmland. So, um, but you're always welcome to reach out to me directly as well. You can find all my uh, email and phone numbers through any of those resources. That's awesome. Yeah, we'll include all that in the show notes as well. So if you guys are watching this on YouTube, go ahead in the description, you'll be able to access that information. <clears throat> and if you guys are watching this or listening to this in a podcast format, it'll be in the description as well. So. Well, awesome. Thanks again, Mike. We really do appreciate your time. For those of you guys who are tuning in, we do this every other week where we invite speakers to talk about a variety of different topics pertaining to commercial real estate. We greatly appreciate you coming and engaging. Keep coming back, keep engaging, and we'll talk to you guys soon. It was good seeing you guys.